We're counting down the days until Hawthorne's season opener with old arch rivals Essendon at the MCG, and there's plenty to get to, including our chat with three-time Premiership Hawk Luke Bruce. So let's get down to business. My name is Nick Mason, and with me as always is a man that was delighted to chat with one of the very best to ever play for Hawthorne. G'day, Tiz. G'day, mate. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, a little bit of a peek behind the curtain at what's happening at Hawthorne presently, but also a bit of a dive back into the past for some of our favourite moments, including... Well, it was pretty indulgent, actually, talking about one of my favourite goals of all time. Yeah, but it is one of the best Hawthorne goals of all time, so no need to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Very much a cathartic moment for every Hawker present, and, and at home. But of course, we're on the cusp of a brand new campaign, Tiz. How are you feeling about the season ahead? Well, I'm excited now. I was more mildly interested about round one, <laughs> and then... Luke told me how good it's going to be, so... Jeez, uh... oh, no pressure. <laughs> there was a point in the interview, that w- which listeners will, uh, will pick up as, as it plays out later on this episode, where Luke was basically talking up the fact that, you know, round one, you're raring to go, there's, you know, no injuries, no corkies, and I thought to myself, no excuses. Oh, that's a bit <laughs> rough. <laughs> he was just saying it's, it's going, everyone's primed. This is the week they're all primed for, round one. And then he added, apart from finals, because, you know, he has seen it all. He really has. He's been to the top of the summit three times. Uh, But we're going to get to all that. We're focusing on this season for the moment. And I I suppose, in terms of gauging our excitement levels, focusing on a few individuals that we're most excited to see in action this season. With the proviso that we had to have written their player profile for the mag, so it means that we're, (laughs) we're a little restricted. We can't keep picking the same players because it's becoming a bit of a theme. I'll be honest. I I had, obviously, you you took the evens, I took the odds, and obviously Mitch Lewis was absolutely going to be among mine. When he is back in action, we're not sure when that is. Could be round four, but then again, it is Hawthorne and injuries. It could be round 14. So (laughs) you just don't know. But the other guy I was going to say was Fergus Green. Yeah, and neither of them made my list. So... (laughs) (laughs) And that's the way we've broken it down. So how do you want to do this? Because I've taken... From my pool, the the players with odd numbers on their backs, you've taken from the even pool. Should we just go back and forth? You first, Nick. Off you go. Well, it's got to be Josh Ward, number 25, who seems to be the future of that engine room. And I I think we could be very excited by even, you know, the first month of footy. Yeah, so he he had a bit of an interrupted preseason, but the last few weeks have been excellent from Josh Ward. So I am very much excited to see what he produces in the first month, but also throughout the whole year, because he should have a good basis now. Really quality accumulator and distributor of the footy. I feel like he takes the right options. He's looking even more comfortable at the level these days. And, uh, yeah, I just can't wait to see what he produces. He'll produce some spectacular handballs out to Carl Amon, who's my first pick, the new arrival. Uh, His link play between backline and, and into the attack. Um, is exactly what I've been looking for um, since he shall not be named left. And also before that, when uh, when Hilly was running around, we sort of missed that dynamic between the wingman and the backs and the forwards, sometimes even trying to use backmen as wingmen. So to have an out-and-out wingman should be fantastic for us. It feels like just a little while since we've had that kind of electricity on the wing, that X factor. I think Carl actually brings that. We've had guys that are capable of playing that position, there's no question, but I think there's just something special brewing with Carl Amon being positioned there. And we're also leaning into quickness, fleet of foot, so it's it's good to watch. Well, in terms of a recruitment, it, it just has that synergy with what, what strategy we're going for. It makes sense. It, you know, I don't think any Hawthorne fan was left scratching their head saying, well, why Carl Amon? Well, if you've seen what Sam Mitchell's trying to do, and indeed we're seeing the, the second version of that this year, which seems to be just a little bit of refinement on that same old game plan, uh, yeah, you can tell that Carl slots straight into that. Carl wearing the number 10, of course. Perfect 10. He does have the same haircut as O'Meara, which just, I, I think that's 
unnecessary. Oh, it's all to bamboozle the opposition, you see, it is. It's all strategic. Anyway, is there anyone on your list that Carl might find in the forward line? Well, in time, maybe Jack O'Sullivan. Really? Yeah, maybe a, a little bit later in the season. But uh, I don't know, there's just something really exciting about Jack as this little terrier that's going to harass and hound the opposition and just be a bit of a live wire up forward. Is that Jack Two Broken Collarbone Sullivan? Jack Kamikaze Football O'Sullivan, <laughs> I think you're referring to. Yeah, he uh, he comes with big raps for bravery and, and tenacity of the footy pressure acts inside inside 50. It'll be... Um, yeah, it'll be something to get into the lineup this year from um, for him because he's quite a quite a late pick, but uh, he he could get a lot of time at Box Hill. Well, yeah, that's my caveat is that I don't necessarily expect to see him debut this year. I don't have those high standards to put upon him, but I, I think oh, so. We we can be excited to watch at Box Hill as well. Yeah, well, absolutely. I've got a bloke like that too. Okay, go on, Seamus Mitchell, like. It has been all preamble up until now. <laughs> yeah. We've seen a few glittering highlights, and, and but he's done the Dylan Moore thing where he's managed to get a contract when it seemed like it was impossibility. And, uh, yeah, I'm very excited to see what he can produce at Box Hill for, for little John as well. With a new coach, where are they going to place him? He came to us as a remarkably talented small forward. Where does he go now? Well, there's the inspiration for him right there as vice-captain, newly appointed vice-captain uh, Dylan Moore, um, who, you know, was almost shuffled off the list. And, you know, we see what he's made of his career now. He's an out-and-out star for Hawthorne and one of the best forwards in the comp uh, for his size anyway. Um, Seamus Mitchell has that all before him. It is possible. The door's not shut on him just yet. Surely, surely they don't leave him as a, a, as a rebounding defender. Is that what you were going to say? No, I do agree with your assessment in our mag that I, I think he does find himself eventually in the forward line once again. But in terms of enjoying his, uh, his footy at Box Hill, mate, he's got a debut, doesn't he? Because if he doesn't make it to the lineup, then I think he's off the list. That's... That's got to be it, right? Yeah, it's going to be a very exciting ride watching Seamus. He's zippy, he's skillful, he can heap on the pressure, just needs to put it together for long enough and make an impression that he gets his chance. In the mag, I really wanted to mention Get Smart, you know, at the start yeah. of, the, of an episode where all the doors shut behind. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but I couldn't work it in. I'm just not that skilled. That's all right. You worked it in here pretty skillfully. It wasn't... You know, crowbarred in at all. Until it's edited out. Yep. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> uh, whose turn was it? I think it was back to me, wasn't it? After chatting about Jack O'Sullivan, who... Yeah, J- Jack and Seamus might be fighting for that same spot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But one has time on his side. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Jack has uh, a lot more leeway in that regard. Uh, my next You've player... You've got another bloke. you got another bloke fighting for the same spot here. What do we just love... Small forwards, is that the idea? I don't know if that's true. Connor McDonald, I imagine, eventually graduates to the midfield. He plays off half forward to begin with. I think we start seeing him get a bit more inside mid-time, and that's what makes me excited. A lot of people are saying he's flying under the radar. Well, he's just got the silkiness and the class about him, doesn't he? It just he, He's a playmaker, and he feels like it, it just feels like watching him, there's a lot that's possible. Does he have the tank? I think he builds the tank. I mean, this is year two, after all. So I'm not saying that he slots in there straight away. You've got to remember that we have a fair bit of midfield depth now in terms of sheer experimentation. We haven't settled on the lineup, but we're going to be running a few guys through there. And I, I just think that he'll get his chance eventually. They're pushing long in, into the inside mid. They, they're looking at putting Butler into the midfield as well. It's just going to be one fantastic what, rotation through the midfield after another in a few years. Yep, Hustwaite, Stevens. It's a bit of a log jam. There's an audition process happening in in year two under Sam Mitchell, and it's all about the midfield. Yeah, Connor McDonald, I am excited for Connor. As you know, I, he he kicked the favourite goal for me last year from against Collingwood. Um, I think it was Impey up the middle with pace, and then Connor just drilled it without thinking. There was an absolute beauty against. Now this was a game to forget, the one against the Western Bulldogs. But you know, transition footy that Connor McDonald was involved in around half back, getting it all the way to the goal line to Dylan Moore. When you actually stop and think about it, Conor McDonald, he had his hand in a lot of great goals and plays last year. And there's something about him that's just incredibly classy. And like I said, a playmaker where you just... 
he creates possibilities, and that's what I like about him. That's why he's in my, one of my most exciting players to watch this year. And he's also in a key position to be creative, which is why I like Will Day having moved to the midfield. Because I feel like that is where he can be at his most creative, not off the half back line, but not having you know not having to look after his man, but in the midfield, hopefully with someone else putting the pressure on, <laughs> uh, and he can get out, get to the side, pick the right option, pick an option that, as a fan, you don't expect from the stands. That's always good to see. Yeah, I'm very excited for Will Day in his new role taking advantage of that mastery of time and space that that uncanny way that he, he has about him where he can just sort of stop prop and weave his way through think his way through a tight situation where the walls seem to be closing in on him pretty fast but he always picks the right option which is great to see yeah you can see his eyes focusing on the opportunities ahead of him as as, the, as he tries to evade players in his vision but uh, he doesn't observe them it's a it's a fascinating technique it's a Matrix-like bullet time that Will Day has about him. Now, uh, you have one more and I have one more. Yeah, that's true. We've both gone back to the midfield for this uh, final selection, and it should be no surprise. No, uh, Backman just aren't watchable. No, I mean, <laughs> no surprise that my next selection is, of course, going to be Jai Newcomb, wearing the number three. Uh, lethal, back to his best. Jordan Lewis, back to his best. Just the epitome of that competitive spirit that Jai has that makes him such a joy to watch. You know, it's what you want as a fan. You want a guy that's going to give his absolute all and and just empty the tank. And that's that's what Jai's given us from game one. Yeah, but he also has fantastic abilities in front of goal. It's 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 weird. It's so weird. We should pinch ourselves that this is a mid season pickup. <laughs> well, exactly. And that's what makes him so immensely watchable, right? Is he's got this competitive streak and he's got this in and under grit about his game but he also has a fair bit of class as well like when when Jai takes the game on it's just such a joy to watch and he also brings his teammates with him which is going to be important this year because there's going to be some downers going to be some real down moments and they're going to have to pick themselves up these boys and, and Jai Newcomb never wants for picking himself up after a contest well that's that never say die stuff about Jai Newcomb that, that is just amazing and so enjoyable and it could be that, you know, I think he has a PCM in his future, and it could be as soon as this year. I guess we'll just wait and see. I think, obviously, he's got hot competition from, well, the other podium finishes last year. I think Sicily will be hard to unseat, and I think Dylan Moore is going to be right on right on their heels as well. So I guess we'll wait and see. But, yeah, Jai Newcomb was a very easy pick for one of the most watchable Hawthorne players heading into this season. Lucky last, another bloke that doesn't seem phased by opinion or expectation or well anything really Cameron McKenzie he's only just arrived and I'm very excited I'm not sure he debuts round one I'm a little bit cautious on that well you know what we like to do with this podcast is when you take one position I take the other uh, but genuinely though I do think he does play round one I think he does get picked well I look forward to that I'm, I'm very excited about next Sunday and if Cameron McKenzie's out there all to the good. I know we debuted a couple of um, debutantes in round one last year, so but of course that was against the ruse. <laughs> so all bets are off, is that what you're saying? <laughs> uh, no, no. Cameron McKenzie does look very good. Perhaps he'll be, perhaps he'll be the sub. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, we do have to account for the sub once again. A um, little bit of uh, opposition analysis. Essendon's going to be without Jake Stringer. Yeah, well, as we said last time, I called him Stringer, and you sort of rolled your eyes a bit, but. Uh, Look, <laughs> you're not Nostradamus for saying that Stringer's missing the game. Mate, they've built their whole game plan around Stringer, and it's going to be magnificent all year. I still think it's the tall guy we've got to watch out for, personally, but if we don't if we don't manage that, he'll come back to haunt us. Look, it'll be a good game either way. I think we've got a really good shot with a young team, and uh, everyone will be primed for it. I'm, I'm very excited. Now, it sounds like we're wrapping up, but on the contrary, we have a lot more to get to because speaking of immensely watchable players, what about this guy, our special guest this episode, three-time AFL Premiership player, two-time All-Australian, four-time leading goal kicker of Hawthorne. It is, of course, Luke Bruce. Yeah, if you want an introduction on how Hawthorne might perform against Essendon, Go to the bloke who's played the most on the list at the moment. And shown them up most. It was an absolute <laughs> joy to chat to Luke, one of my favourite Hawthorne players. Please enjoy our chat with Luke Bruce. 
G'day, Luke. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Hawk Talk podcast. And congratulations on the vice captaincy alongside Dylan Moore, recognised as a leader of this great club. Could you tell us a bit about what the position means to you? Yeah, g'day, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it does mean a lot. Uh, obviously, been at this club for a, a significant period now, so to get the recognition of, of vice captaincy is, is nice. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change um, the way I go about it too much. Um, yes, it's a title and um, the external world. Um, you ask, you get asked a few questions. Even the last few weeks have been asked, what what changes do you have to do? More meetings or media or whatever it is, but not too much changes. Uh, I'll still go about my business um, as usual and um, continue to try and part as much information onto these young guys as as much as possible and and help them grow and uh, mature and be, I guess, leaders of this footy club and, and take us back to where we want to go. What number pre-season is this? It's got to be business as usual at this point. <laughs> um, number 15. Number 15. So they, I saw them coming the other day. I'm not sure whether they get easier or harder. Um, you sort of get to a stage where you get a bit sick of running around in circles and you want those games to start. Um, and at the end of the day, it's that match fitness that you sort of need to get anyway um, before you you really top off. A few different faces around you, of course, Luke. Um, now, we mentioned, obviously, you uh, your vice captain alongside you, Dylan Moore. Uh, you had a mentorship. Much has been made about that, your mentorship of Dylan Moore. We're wondering who's the next protege at the moment. Maybe there's a couple, not just one. And uh, could you tell us a bit about how they're tracking at the moment? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, as you said, there's probably not one. There's probably a few in the forward line that I'm working pretty closely with. I've, Sammy Butler uh, is the one that probably first jumps to mind. Um, Jack O'Sullivan as well uh, is another in terms of just guys who are in my position, uh, easy to align. I guess that mentor, mentor sort of relationship um, starts quite casually and um, they sort of want to pick my brain a, about the position and the way I go about it. And at the same time, uh, I want to I want to try and help them improve and, and fast track their development. So they're probably the two um, jumping out. And then just from a, as I said, not maybe not a position leadership, but um, position of um, similar position. So more just general leadership would be someone like a Will Day, um, even even a James Warple, who they're still quite young. And I know James has been in the leadership group before, but um, just helping them with general life and leadership and uh, making them better humans than they uh, walked in the door. Yeah, because it's such a it's such a big thing now. AFL, you uh, you got to the club and I think you had a broken leg and yeah. you spent a, a couple of years recovering and getting used to being an AFL player. And, and these boys, they're looking at debuting in the first 12 months they're at the club and if they don't, there's question marks around and there's a lot of pressure on the young kids at our, at our club at the moment. Yeah, for sure. And I, I was so lucky that the club was so patient with me. I think, as I said, I was broken leg in under 18 years, so draft year. Um, took a little bit of time to get back uh, from that in my first pre-season then was interrupted again in the start of my third year with some groin issues so um, if I was maybe at another club that didn't have that patience and didn't have the faith in me then um, I certainly could have been out in the scrap heap um, but you're right these guys come in I think they are better prepared than we were back then uh, they they come in their aerobic capacity is outstanding most of them um, a few of them already got bodies that are high 70s to sort of low 80s in terms of kilograms whereas I was I was sort of 70 kilos ring and wet and, and couldn't couldn't put on weight so um, they're already a few steps ahead of me but um, at the same time there is a lot of pressure on them um, there's selection pressure there's they, they've trained well but then going to a, a match intensity against the proper opposition is a whole nother level again to just training out here with with our squad so um, there's yeah I flicked Nick a photo of you uh, in the Sydney Swans Reserves Premiership, yeah, and a, and a few of the boys that were running around in that, and we just have to thank our lucky stars that the Hawks took you because you were pre-listed to Sydney, weren't you? Yeah, so I was. I didn't even know how it sort of worked back then. They had selections on or priority selections on New South Wales guys. As I said, I sort of broke my leg June that year. Uh, it got to just before draft camp and and the draft, and they they let us know that they weren't taking any. New South Wales guys for the year, they wanted to take an international rookie in, I think it was like Mike Pike. And then I think they took like a, another Irishman or something. So us New South Wales boys were sort of left behind. And yeah, fortunately, Graham Wright had watched some of that vision that you mentioned and uh, got me down to train. And then, yeah, the rest is history. So I've certainly got Wrighty to thank for uh, most of my career. 
And you've got a distinct style in how you play AFL footy that comes from the rugby background. And we spoke to you after the AGM and you were telling us how you try to teach the boys how to tuck it under the arm and the fend off and the shrug of the hips and just, just keep going, power through the tackles. How, how does that go with, uh, well, maybe you've given a bit of that to Sammy Butler. He's got a bit of aggression there, taken on uh, Sicily behind the ball at, at the, in the pre-season. Yeah, he, he has got a bit of aggression. Um, he's an angry boy, old Sammy. Uh, yeah, you're right, though. It is, it's difficult to, to coach. You can, um, you can certainly talk them through, well, I can talk them through my thinking and thought patterns and when you should do it, when you shouldn't do it, uh, and what I was sort of thinking in that moment. But what they don't remember is that I've been doing that since I was four, five, six years old as a junior rugby league player. Um, so it's very instinctive for me. And as you said, whether it's um, using the fend off or having guys that are around your hips and being able to be strong and stable and, and then be able to drive through that and, and break the tackle is it's it's something I've been doing for a long period of time. So to teach them that, uh, it, it is hard. Uh, I do my best. I, I sort of tell them that it's something you can go to and use when you need to, but I, I'd say you sort of don't focus on it. Um, you, you bring other strengths to the team that that's the reason why you were drafted or that's the reason why you're being selected to play for Hawthorne. So focus on these and then if this complements your game, then um, that's a bonus. And how did the how did the club get you to focus on like your points of difference? Well, I probably knew that I had like Sam Mitchell tells a good story around a, a tackling session where he couldn't lay a hand on me um, for about three or four goes in a row, and he ended up just saying, "No, nah, go back, do it again, do it again." Um, so I, I took great confidence from that that I was he was a a superstar of the competition and um, someone who. I looked up to at the time um, and obviously still have a huge relationship with Mitch as well now. Um, but at the time, he was sort of took me under the wing and, and was helping me get to where I wanted to go. So um, to then do that in a tackling session against him and um, take take confidence from that was, was huge for me. And then from there, it probably got down to my development coaches, um, just continuing to highlight my strengths. I, I knew where the goals were. Um, I had a, a knack of being able to kick kick multiple goals for Box Hill when I was playing down there, and um, the the defensive side of my game was definitely where I needed to improve, and and that was probably the sticking point um, with the conversation with Clarko. A lot of the time was um, you're playing good footy in the VFL, but we need you to to make sure your defensive stuff is consistent so that we can actually give you a game. And um, I remember starting this, uh, starting my second year. I'd, Kick five a few times for Box Hill, a couple of twos and threes here in between, and and still didn't get a look in. Um, but in hindsight, I think it was the best thing that Clarko did to me was just made me be patient, wait it out, continue to hone my craft, and make sure that that defensive side was sound, so that when I did get a chance, I was um, that I didn't look back. Now, Luke, plenty of games over the years you've put through two, three, four, five, six goals. It's one game in particular, and this will be a very indulgent question on my part. One game in particular we had. Just the one goal, but the 2013 grand final, an all-time favourite goal of mine, sharking the tap from Sandilands, snapping it through, a dagger through the hearts of Dockers fans, basically put the result beyond doubt. Uh, could you walk us through your recollection of that goal? Yeah, that's right up there with one of my pretty special moments as well. The adrenaline I felt after that goal was the most adrenaline or out of control feeling I've ever had on a footy field, I reckon. Uh, I don't know what I did. I think I celebrated with Ruffy and Bud or someone like that. I think it was, it was closest to me. Um, but I tell people that, that I generally do not know what I did for the next 10 seconds post post that goal. The, as I said, just the um, excitement and the adrenaline was was quite overwhelming. Uh, but no, it's probably down to the preparation during the week, to be honest. Uh, we knew they wanted to get a, a spare winger at the back of the stoppage. Uh, we knew that Sandalands was a dominant ruckman and if possible the mids would sometimes lock away and then Sandalands would hit to that free winger giving them a easy clearance out of their D50 and um, they could reset up further up the field so uh, we'd, we'd looked at all that during the week uh, I started a fair way away from the stoppage and, and come with a fair bit of momentum and then it comes it comes down to one reading the hit and then two being clean so um, 
I've always said to a lot of these guys here, if, if you can be clean in AFL footy, you're halfway to being a player because uh, the moment you fumble in AFL footy, your, your chance is gone. So for me, luckily that day, took it clean and um, and then snapped truly. So yeah, pretty pretty special moment there. I'm not surprised to learn that there was a lot of prep behind it during the week because you do seem to anticipate it awfully well. You are right onto it in the moment. And I think the thing that makes it... I, I, can't even imagine the feeling being out there having done it but you know being at the ground and again watching it back on on the replay the crowd noise you know sort of breaks once as everyone kind of simultaneously realizes Luke Bruce has done this perfectly and then it breaks again and even louder roar as you put it through I just it's just incredible spine tingling stuff yeah for sure and the way even the way I think there was a defender that, as I said, there was a sweeper, sweeping wing on that defensive side. And for it to be a, a nice little gap to still get the smother off, a lot of the time you end up running into more opponents, even if you do take it cleanly. So on that day to then still have enough time to then steady, take a couple of steps and then snap, um, it was it was pretty, pretty cool. And then as you said, at the end of the day, we knew then we probably had enough of a lead that they'd have to kick three or four in. I think it was like six or seven minutes of footy to to come back and beat us. So it was nearly the sealer that they dreaded, I guess. Oh, it was definite relief from the stands, Luke. <laughs> definite relief on that kick. Well, especially when it had been so tight all day as well. Like it ebbed and flowed. And I think we were the better team on the day. We had got ourselves into a good position. The heartbreak from the year before as well was obviously hanging over our head. So it was, yeah, a, a huge occasion. Another favourite goal of mine is the uh, is the Rioli intercept out to you, onto Poppy and then Gunston in the third quarter of 2015. That's just an all time favourite of mine. That's a beautiful. How quick did that handball come to you? Because it looks like you can just barely capture it with the camera. Well, I think it, I don't even think it was a handball. Was it directly off Cyril's intercept, or was it? Well, or did Cyril take it, handball to me, and then I handballed it back? It's an immediate intercept from Cyril, and then it's in your hands, and the the, back, the camera's behind Cyril, so he can't see how he gets it out to you, but don't tell us he threw it. <laughs> <laughs> no, he definitely, definitely, did, he definitely didn't throw it. I think I remember speaking about that in one of the grand final recalls, and I just remember my, my philosophy of if Cyril was around, just give him the footy uh, um, back then. So I just remember uh, yeah, him obviously intercepting it initially, which he was so good at. Like he's cat-like with his reflexes. Um, and then my my back was to goal. So there's no point in me trying to then face up and, and turn to the opposition because who knows what I was going to run into. So you're better off giving it to to the guy who can get his eyes up and, and look down the field. Um, and then as you said, it goes to Poppy and then Poppy to Gunston and uh, and a goal. So yeah, real special bit of play. It's another, I, I think there's another one from... 2014 where he intercepts goes to McAvoy McAvoy gives it back to him hits Ruffy inside Ruffy kicks the goal like it's it happens too often to be a uh, coincidence that 2014 year was was remarkable for you from round three against Frio you kicked 29 in a row and then we won't mention Razor but that's a (laughs) fantastic that's a fantastic performance how how do you get the psychological focus after you, you know, you've hit twenty five in a row or so. Are you thinking about it or? Yeah, so that was that was an interesting year. So I remember it's probably and it's probably been once I reflected on it all that if the media had got onto it earlier, I reckon I was stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> I I reckon it would have got to the stage where it would have started to be built up more and more that. Uh, the little man on your shoulder just gets louder and louder and bigger and bigger um, that you eventually get a shot. The other thing that I think helped was I reckon while I was about 20, must have been 22 or 23 goals, so I had six or seven to go. And all three goals that I kicked against, I think it was Gold Coast down in Tassie, were all live balls. So they were all either off the pack, um, in live play, off like dribbles or whatever they were. So very instinctive shots of goal. Um, so you don't really get a chance for um, any kind of mental demons or anything to sort of get in the road. It's more just, I've done this a thousand times at, at Waverley. I've done this at training. It's just repetition and sort of rinse and repeat sort of stuff. Um, so that was fortunate. That gets me to sort of 25, I think it was. The following match, I think, was against North Melbourne where I had, 
I had one, I remember getting a set shot and a muck on the boundary, which I'd normally have a left foot snap. Like I'd always have a left foot snap shot. And I tried to pass it inside the Sam Mitchell <laughs> because I knew I was like, if I miss this and that's, it's over. So it did start to come into my head. Um, but I reckon I had a couple of shots from then on where I would have taken in the past and end up trying to pass them off. And then got to, I think I got to 29 without, or oh, maybe a set, maybe one or two set shots, but they would have been from like, not like decent angles, like quite either straight in front or, or whatever. And then the final shot that, that got me uh, over in Adelaide was 45 out on a 45 degree angle. I hit it very well. As you guys would probably know, I, I fade the ball. So I kicked the ball with a left to right fade on it. Um, I started on the left post and unfortunately on that one, it, it didn't fade and stayed stayed dead straight and just missed to the left-hand side. So I'll take it though. I'm happy to sit alongside Plugger and equal, equal the record with him. Fantastic record and great to watch too. Great to watch. You're happy with that, Luke? You, you reckon <laughs> being one of the, the best of all time in history is pretty good? I saw a stat the other day. It was like Plugger kicked seven... 74 times and there's only 50 players in left on lists in 2023 combined that have done it yeah so 50 guys who have kicked seven or more on lists now that's only once and he did it 74 times himself so happy to happy to sit alongside him there now staying with all things forward line uh, we were surprised to see chris newman who's done such a great job with our defensive line he's been appointed forwards coach and how's it been working with chris He's been unreal. He's been a breath of fresh air, to be honest. Uh, as you said, a Dow defender for his uh, his career and then has been a stalwart in our back line for a significant period of time now. I think you guys might know, I think six, maybe seven years down as a as a defender's coach. So I think it's been good for him as well to, to change it up and do something different, uh, open his eyes up a little bit, focus on something else. And it's... I'd say it's a little bit less pressure being the forwards coach than being the backline coach. <laughs> uh, we can have a little bit, we seem to have a little bit more fun down down in the forward line and we can muck around a little bit more, but when we have to be serious and we get to work and uh, do what we do best, but he's been unreal. He's been really good. He's a very um, personable sort of guy, um, builds really strong relationships with his players, builds that trust initially and then sort of works off off the back of that so that you can have, Strong conversations when you need to. Um, so yeah, he's he's been unreal. I had a, a good relationship with him uh, beforehand, but it's yeah, it's gone to another level now. Amazing. Uh, we're heading into Sam Mitchell Mark Two this this second year in his tenure. What are some of the similarities and differences? I guess you've noticed when it comes to how Clarko did things and how Sam approaches coaching. Yeah, it's a good question. I feel to me it seems so it seems like Sam's a lot more settled this year. Uh, he seems to have the people that he wanted in the right spots now and is comfortable and can just let them go to work. Um, you obviously, last year, you sort of got a few guys and people who were still from the sort of the Clarkson mould. So it feels like now it's more of a, a Sam Mitchell club. Um, he's got his fingerprints all over it now. And the biggest difference probably that I've noticed is how, I guess, passionate he is about just the little things um, and how how quickly he wants his team to grow, that drive and the willingness to succeed. He obviously had it as a player in spades um, and, and certainly got the best out of himself, but he's now imparting that on on this group and um, making sure there's no ceiling on how quickly we can uh, get back up the ladder and start to channel, challenge for finals again. And has he managed to impart his... Uh... Well, I reckon it's a hatred for Essendon <laughs> as we go into round one. Well, we're early in the week, so we're only Monday. Uh, but I'm sure by what we got, we got main session on Thursday. But I'm sure by Saturday morning when we do uh, the captain's run, then I think he'll have uh, he'll have something pretty special for us and make sure that we're very motivated and very aware for anyone who wasn't aware that the the hatred between Essendon and, and Hawthorne is, is very real. It's already simmering very nicely. The, the blowtorch has been on Essendon this past week uh, from some of the more high-profile supporters that they have, which is quite incredible. They, they haven't played a game yet this season and already they're under the pump. It's, <laughs> it's quite something. But there's been calls for them to play with a nasty streak 
Um, meanwhile, we know at the Hawks in the off season, you guys have been firing each other up, and you know there's some playful competitiveness out there in training. And what kind of contest are you guys expecting? Do you reckon this this coming weekend? Oh, it's it's round one. You expect nothing less than a fierce contest and ferocity and pressure around the ball. That's probably the first thing you you will get, um, regardless, because everyone's. There's not one point in the season where every player will feel better than now. Like every other week, you're going to have little niggles or injuries or corkies or whatever it is that we get throughout the year. No one is going to feel better than now. So the intensity and the um, the speed at which pressure comes at you or the ball moves or um, people go for marks or tackles or whatever is, is going to be at the highest right now, obviously apart from probably finals. But you expect that. Um, you expect them to to move the ball pretty well. They're obviously uh, pretty talented in their forward line. Um, they've got some some tall timber down there, and Peter Wright who can take a grab. And if Stringer gets up as well, um, and the other thing is their midfield can get off the leash uh, as well. So guys like Merritt and that are, are very dangerous with the ball. So uh, we expect all those things. Us as forward lines, we've got a handful with with Ridley as well. So. Uh, you look at all that, uh, but at the same time, I think one of Mitch's biggest strengths as well is that we focus on on us and, and what we're doing and the system that we want to play. So I'm sure that'll be another main message uh, going into this week is bring your weapons, um, play the way that we want to play and, and back ourselves in. We've loved some of the ball movement recently. It's great to watch. Really good. Yeah, it is good. It's, it's nice as a forward that uh, we can, yeah, we, if we can continue to get some ball movement like that, then... It just gives us a, or gives us as forwards the best chance to work our defenders over and um, and get shots on goal. We're, we're heading into another campaign with sort of an all new Hawthorne. It's a new look Hawthorne. What makes this group so exciting to be part of right now? Uh, first and foremost, I think the desire to get better is the best I've seen for a long time. And I know that's easy to say because you've got a young group and, and things like that. But even during the the premiership years, guys were, were so eager and keen to to get better and, and fight for spots. And, and at the end of the day, that's what you need. You need that competition for spots. And although, as I said, we're young and people expect us to be out of the eight and things like that, you, that competition for spots has never been more fierce um, to, oh, that I can remember anyway. So that's that's huge. Uh, the other thing is that probably the, the running profile. So I know Peter Burgess... Um, been spoken about a lot but he's been a huge uh, addition to our our fitness staff and has got us in unbelievable condition and there's obviously an athletic profile that that comes with that in terms of guys ability to run long distance or um, speed over shorter distance or whatever like you look at our half back line and I think everyone gets pretty excited at uh, their running capacity and their ability to break lines and things like that so I think that's exciting about this group is that we should be able to run teams sort of off their legs um, and we should be able to, well, I hope supporters can see us end of third quarters and into last quarter starting to to really challenge size with our, with our run. Oh, it sounds good. I'm getting really excited now. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other thing is just from, from my personal um, opinion, watching them and, and training with them is I think our, our last two drafts have been, have been very solid for us. So if you can get a couple of guys from each draft or even if you get, more than that, who end up playing 100, 150 games for your footy club, then that's it's 10 years of service. It goes a long way to, to taking your footy club where you want to go. So um, that's a, another exciting thing from my point of view. One thing I need to say, I'm, I'm sure Tiz will echo my sentiments here as well, Luke, is that we're in an era of AFL now where loyalty is not always front and centre. You know, you can have your favourite players and in due course they can disappear and go elsewhere. But... Um, Sticking with Hawthorne, sticking with the brown and gold has been incredible. And I, I want to convey my thanks to you for that because you, you've certainly had some offers, but, but to stick around and mentor this very young, fresh-faced side, uh, even though it, it's it's quite possible you won't see the next premiership that this club wins. I, I think everyone can concede that, but yet you've stuck around. And I, I just think it's incredible. So thank you for sticking with us. Yeah, brilliant stuff. And the way you've... Uh... You've brought more on. How he's become a terrific player, just from where he was looking like he was off the list to where he is now, and for you both to be vice captain, it's just a terrific story. Yeah, no, it has been. It's been 
so enjoyable. And that and that's one example of a, a number of reasons why you end up staying at a footy club like this. Probably another reason would be the way I was brought up and um, the family values and that that you, you get instilled into you from a, a young age. So you probably got to thank mum and dad and my brother and sister and wife, Anthony, and these sort of things where you get, you got these values that sort of just, they're this there and you don't, you sort of don't want to break them. So I'm very loyal and honest and committed. And if well, I say that I'm going to do something, then, um, then you want to do it. So it's probably a, all of that is a, is the reason why I end up staying. And fortunately for me, as you said before, like I'm, I might miss the next one. I might not, who knows, but to have had success already at this great club um, and to have played in premierships and, and won premierships and, um, and tasted that success, I know how good it is. And as you said, yes, I mightn't be a part of the next one, but I, I can at least help these guys and, and sort of try and guide them and impart as much wisdom as I can on them to, to be the best they can and um, continue to drive. And I'll be proud as punch, mate, if, if they got there one day um, after I did finish. But he's hoping we can we can turn it around and um, who knows, the next couple of years we might might be able to be up there and challenging again. But if, if it isn't to be, then um, as I said, I'll be so proud if they, they did eventually hold one up. Well, he is hoping. I think either way, whether it's still within your era or it's a little bit beyond that, we'll know. Hawks supporters will know that that it will be built upon the work that's happening right now. And this coming weekend, it all begins again, Sunday, March 19th, 3.20pm, Hawks versus Essendon at the MCG. Uh, Luke, thank you so much for joining us here on the Hawk Talk podcast. No worries. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Have a great year. Um, And if you can get down to as many games, guys, we do appreciate it. The sound that you guys make and G and every other stadium around the country is, is fantastic. So thank you. There you have it, folks. Business as usual for Luke Bruce, handing the Bombers a big fat L on the weekend. I'm sure it's going to be great to see him in action for another season. Like I said, he's one of my favourites, Tiz. Uh, and yeah, just so fun to watch. Of course he's your favourite, Nicky. He asked you what your Mason's multi was going to be this week. That's not true. That, not even <laughs> off the record is that true. <laughs> Talk about crowbarring stuff in. My goodness. <laughs> Are we doing it again? Is this happening? Uh, look, I entertain it for round one. Is Okay. I couldn't understand why all the other games were on the run down here, but I just want to mention that uh, what a remarkable man Luke Bruce is. You mentioned his loyalty and... Uh, he has that in spades and he's devoted to Hawthorne and he's just trying to give back as much as he's received. It's in, an incredible ethos from him. You've got to admire a man that lives by his values and principles and uh, lives them in accordance with what's happening at Hawthorne. He's uh, he's helping to build the future, whether he's part of it or not. That's admirable. Just terrific. It's exactly what you want to hear from a, from a champion, you know? Now, as for Mason's multi... Uh, will I do it beyond round one? I think there's a question on your lips. Well, I'll tell you what. If I win, yeah, sure. But we know <laughs> that there's Buckley's chance of that happening, so that's why I'm committed to it. There's no way I'm winning in round one. But look, we will go through the first, uh, the opening round of the season and uh, have a look at the other matches happening. All right. So Richmond, who, who think they've already made the top four and are acting like it, um, with their incredible number of small forwards that look incredibly skilled versus Carlton who have every benefit from AFL house to try and get them over the line if this if they're sitting about 10th they'll probably rewrite the finals qualifications as they get (laughs) nearer to the end of the season just to get Carlton limping into the finals I wouldn't be surprised Richmond Carlton who do you pick I'm gonna go with Richmond but I think it should be a ripper of a contest uh now Friday evening we've got Geelong Collingwood the grand final we should have had that's right Uh, famously also I I always stumble over Friday nights as far as my tips go but you can't look past Geelong at this point can you I mean really the last game they played was a was basically a masterpiece they put Sydney to the sword there's no reason to not pick Geelong okay all right now let's see what you do here because North Melbourne versus West Coast at uh, Marvel Stadium on Saturday. It's probably a harder choice, this one. This is an absolute nightmare. I, can I pick neither? I guess picking neither would be a draw. Well, it's actually quite fascinating because West Coast have kept their older heads, left them on the list, whereas Hawthorne have decided to just really reset. Are they going to have more wins as a result of that process? or And where's North Melbourne in this? They've brought in a key back. They've brought in a new coach. There's aggression everywhere. Are they going to have a full squad by round 10? <laughs> oh, well, I'll say this of West Coast. I, I don't think 
this season will resemble last year's. Um, not in quite the same way. I think they'll still be down near the bottom of the ladder, but they won't be dead last or anything like that. Um, do they play well at Marvel? I don't know. I think just because it's at Marvel, I might tip north. And a preview of this year's grand final, Port Adelaide versus Brisbane? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, Brisbane for me. Yeah, and how many is Jack kicking? Uh, three, minimum. Melbourne versus the Western Bulldogs? Uh, I'll go with Melbourne. Gold Coast versus Sydney? Sydney. Greater Western Sydney versus Adelaide? I'm going to tip Adelaide, actually. Yeah, they look a bit better. Greater Western Sydney look like the Spooners, to be quite honest. Well, it's GWS and perhaps the Saints and... We're in contention as well, obviously, that must be said. North in contention as well. Essendon. Yeah, Essendon perhaps, yeah. So I think there's a few vying for that, whether they like it or not. We'll just skip our contest and move straight on to St Kilda versus Frio. Which Ross Lyon-backed uh, establishment are you picking? Have you heard the audio yet? <laughs> I cannot pick St Kilda. There's just no way. They've, they might as well just reserve a whole ward for them at the, at the nearest hospital. It is... Their injury list is ridiculous. And also, Fremantle are pretty good in their own right. So, no, I won't be picking the Saints for that one. I don't care where it's played. So, Nick, we've got to, we've got to brave the filth that is the Essendon supporters next Sunday, selling our mag outside the G. And, uh, you know, if the result is as good as we hope we'll be able to sell it afterwards as well because I've all left it three-quarter time. <laughs> That's right. What do you expect? I expect it to be uh, hit and miss as far as Hawthorne implementing their game plan. I think we know what it's meant to look like. Whether it comes together is another question. I think that when it doesn't, there's going to be the kind of turnovers that make you tear your hair out a bit because you know what it's meant to look like. And when it doesn't come together, it's going to be like, oh, missed by that much. You know, speaking of Get Smart before. But um, oh, look, I, I think we're a good chance to beat them. I'm not, I'm not, just not sure what Essendon are this year. I, I, don't, I look at them on paper and I'm not sure what's meant to be inspirational about them and what they're doing. The, the best thing I could say about them is they have a new coach. And that's about it. I think I think you're very I think you're very canny there. I think the team that wins is the one that's prepared to make the most errors. Yeah. So the more attacking team will win. I think it'll be an interesting contest. I think it'll be close for much of the day. But you've got to back yourselves and I think the belief amongst the group is pretty good. Yeah, I mean given the era that we're in and you know, we know that it's gonna be a bit of a slog and it's an uphill climb to get back to that summit. Uh, yeah, no, I, th- I think the, the morale seems to be good with the club. Seems to be good with supporters, all things considered. And uh, if you can't go, just get the KO deal. Yeah, do get the KO deal. This is something that was flagged recently on TikTok and has done the rounds on the other socials. Uh, people saying, look, if you want KO just a, bit, a little bit cheaper, uh, the Western Bulldogs have a great deal. And I thought to myself... They can't be the only club doing this. And when I looked into it, no, I'm pretty sure it's all clubs, including Hawthorne. Hawthorne have a special KO membership. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I've got my membership sorted. Why do I need another one? And why wasn't included with the one I bought? But yeah, go on. Yeah, no, I get that frustration. But the fact is, if you're going to pay for KO anyway, and if you want the basic package, you might as well do it this way. Hawthorne are offering, I think it's $250 uh, for the year, for the, the KO basic package, plus you get uh, one general admission game free, you get a $25 Hawks Nest voucher, the membership includes entry to Box Hill and uh, VFLW games. There's If you're going to pay for KO anyway, you might as well save yourself a lot of money. Look into it. Hawthorne have a KO membership, so give it a Google, and uh, yeah, very worthwhile getting. I mean, and it'll be, give us a boost, like the pet memberships used to give us a boost. <laughs> I didn't think of that. But yeah, that, that might well be true. Yeah, my budgie loves Hawthorne. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> hey, speaking of uh, commercialism and capitalism and all that stuff, we're going to be selling our mag this weekend. Oh, God. <laughs> Did you really do that? Oh, we don't even have a price yet. I reckon we keep it the same. There's been a price freeze tiz. We're following suit, we're following the AFL in that regard. Uh, yeah, our season guide is coming out this week. Uh, there'll be digital copies, there'll be hard copies as well. We'll be selling hard copies of that magazine outside the ground on game day. So Hawthorne Essendon at the MCG, kicking off 3.20pm. Uh, in terms of time and location, that's going to be posted to our socials this week and also on the day to remind people. So do keep a lookout for that. Awesome. Well, what a terrific episode. I think we're all excited after Luke Bruce has spoken about how the club's tracking before round one. And uh, although there might be at points in the season where you 
wonder where we're going to see our next win from. I think the first month offers some really good opportunities. And of course, we're going to be along for the ride every single week. Make sure you join us uh, and stream on Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can leave us a rating and review there. We'd really appreciate that. We're also on Twitter at HawkTalkPod, Facebook, facebook.com slash HawkTalkPod, and we're over on Instagram. But of course, the Hawk Talk podcast is made possible thanks to our proud, passionate, and paid-up Patreon subscribers who support the show and get some sweet, sweet bonus content in the process. A shout-out to our latest subscriber, David, also known as Kiwi Hawk. Thanks so much for getting on board, David. Uh, now, as I said, if you'd like a digital copy of our season guide, we are going to have those available, but... You can get one if you sign up to Patreon. For all the details, head to patreon.com slash hawktalkpod. And all those that are going to the Norwood game, uh, please let us know, as you have been doing. I know a few have already hit us up to say, come say hi at the game. Yeah, absolutely. That, that would be amazing. Uh, we, we'd love to say hi to people and you know share a drink with the Hawthorne faithful. And that's going to be a hell of an experience. I saw that the AFL website published uh, an article recently saying that Norwood's rolling out the red carpet. It just for you, is it? Or, or did, they, did they hear about your experience at Arden Street where you didn't get one of those little stackable chairs? Mate, there's a lot you can't get at Arden Street. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be great. I'm so looking forward to our Adelaide road trip for Gather Round. But of course, for now, we've got our sights set on round one, mate. Hawthorne versus Essendon at the MCG at 3.20pm. I'll catch you outside the ground to sell the mag. See you there, mate. We are a happy team at Hawthorne.